So, Dorotheus of Gaza was a Christian monk of the 5th century of the Common Era, or if you'd prefer, <laughs> the 5th century AD, the year of our Lord, right? So he joined a desert monastery under the influence of two elders, and while they remained active, he held back and simply focused on his ascetic, his spiritual practice. And it's only after the death of one and the others retreat into a vow of silence that he came forward and began to present his own teaching. His approach was extremely direct, clear, simple, nothing fancy. You could even say it was quite down to earth. And uh, after his death, many of his sayings were collected into what came to be known today as the uh, his directions on spiritual training. And it's one of those sayings that I wish to discuss today. So Dorotea said, Over whatever you have to do, even if it be very urgent and demands great care, I would not have you argue or be agitated. For rest assured, everything you do, be it great or small, is but one-eighth of the problem. Whereas, to keep one's state undisturbed, even if thereby you should fail to accomplish the task, is the other seven-eighths. All right. So, whatever it is you're doing, the outcome is one-eighth of what's important. Whereas your mental state, your emotional state, your calm, your balance, your lack of negative emotions is seven-eighths of what's important. And so Dorote said. So there's two things I want to say about this. One the more modest point, and then the other one's more expansive. So, number one. If what he's just said sounds kind of off to you, you don't have to take it at face value. All right? You don't have to necessarily believe that maintaining that your emotional state, that maintaining your calm through a task, is actually seven times more important than the outcome. Right? The point of the seven-eighths line is that it shocks us out of the opposing over-tendency. So, for example, right? let's say you always tilt way to the right. Okay? And let's say I want to get you to sit straight. Maybe I could tell you, okay, look, tilt 10 centimeters to the right, but because you're so fixated on this way that if I tell you 10 centimeters, you'll just do this, okay? Whereas if I tell you, look, like, tilt 10 light years to the right, even if literally that would take you to the <laughs> other side of the sun, right? If I tell you that, because you're so over-tending this way, it'll actually get you here. Then perfect, right? Then I say, tilt 10 light, 10 light years that way. So to give a more maybe <laughs> practical example, right? Let's say you're an extremely nervous public speaker. And you tend to go, you know, all machine gun mouths, you know, you're just word spilling out so fast and no one can actually follow you. All right. I might tell you, okay, look, the actual content of what you're saying, the words you say and the order you say them in, that's just one eighth of what's important. All right. Seven eighths of what's important is your tone of voice, softening it, slowing down, having a more at ease body language, just mellowing your energy. That that's seven eighths of what's important. So again, whether actually that is seven eighths of what's important is kind of immaterial, right? It doesn't really matter. It's just there to shock you, right, out of your greatest weakness, you know. So that's the first point, right? Very simple. You don't have to take it at face value. But nevertheless, this exaggeration, this exaggerated kind of language is pragmatically useful, right? It's skillful. It's, um, yeah. <laughs> that's the first point. <laughs> All right. Now the second point is a bit broader in scope, and it uh, broaches an issue which I doubt will be too much of a surprise to you, and uh, I suspect will become something of a running theme. <laughs> so this time, it's about what happens if you take that one-eighth, seven-eighths distinction a bit more at face value, a bit more seriously, a bit more literally, right? 
<laughs> okay, so how am I going to put this without sounding completely lame? <laughs> okay, basically, there are two approaches to life. The worldly and the spiritual. So with the first, it's about getting certain desirable things. Wealth. Sexual partner, sexual partners, fame, renown, honor, respect, security, <laughs> as in, you know, a, you know, a house, money, that kind of security, right? And then there's the other approach to life, the spiritual one. And what that's about is tricky to say, right? But basically it's in contrast to the last one, right? It's not about those other things. It's about something else, right? It's about more existential issues. It's about more, basically, it's less about anything external to you, right? It's about your inner sense of peace or well-being or existential security, right? Another way to look at it is, you know, the first approach is that you try to fulfill your desires by actually going out and getting things or doing things. And then the second one, it's more about... <laughs> Diminishing your desires, or wrestling with them, or yeah, taking it an, ins an inside approach to handling them. Another way to look at it is slightly more psychological, right? You get people who are more competitive, more go-getting, more self-starting, and then you have people who are a bit more. <laughs> Uh, and then you get people who are a bit more soft, <laughs> with a tendency to anxiety and depression, with a tendency to be preoccupied with existential issues. And for that kind of person, a life of striving to reach those desirable social goals can be a form of torture, basically, you know, which they're not well suited for. And the name we give for the kind of life that is well suited for this kind of people is a spiritual life. Now, obviously, this is a gross oversimplification, you know, there's a spectrum, and again, even, this is, might not even be the right spectrum. And everyone, I think almost everyone has, you know, both sides to them, right? But, you get it, right? <laughs> this isn't news, really, to anyone. And here's, and here's the basic point, right? It appears that back in the day, society had a little bit more room for both approaches. If you had it really bad, you know, you become a monk, you become a nun. If you're a bit more functional, you, know, you become a priest. You're the forward-facing uh, side of, of, of a religious institution. You actually deal with worldly people and speak to them in a language that they understand. And if you're even more functional than that, then you become a pious layperson, right? You sort of live a normal life in the world. But when you go to social, when you go to religious services, you know, they mean a lot to you. You know, so a religious service can be just a sort of, you can go there out of social, pure social obligation or out of a sense of community, or you can go there and, you know, really, really get a lot out of this kind of thing. And uh, so you have the spectrum, right, within religious institutions of how, just how, you know, spiritual are you, just how worldly are you. But there's, you know, there's, there's basically the social room for, for, for sensitive people along this, along this axis, right? And then the thing is, right? What happens when you get rid of the social institution that structured life in this way? Right? What happens when the Catholic Church of medieval Europe or sort of Buddhism in Southeast Asia starts to get eroded and not replaced by anything else? <laughs> replaced only by a you know, competitive market in which everyone's you know, dog eat dog, um, you know. A world in which everyone is basically a sort of desperate hustler. Everyone's, you know, trying to jockey for for position and sort of, you know, game the system and make it make it for themselves. Because it's not as if all those people who before would have been monks and nuns and priests or devout, pious lay people or mystics <laughs> or shamans or hermits or <laughs> divine madmen. It's not, as if people, it's not as if these people disappear, right? It's, they don't go anywhere. They just they just get labeled as sensitive people, intense people. 
And it's not as if all of them can become, you know, successful creatives. <laughs> you know, they can't all land a book deal. They can't all make it through the academic minefield. They can't all, you know, get into the right galleries or game the algorithm or win the lottery. <laughs> so for these kinds of people, right, for the more sensitive, for the more spiritually disposed, right, they need two things. Right? They need an overarching social narrative which gives meaning and purpose to their lives, right, which sort of justifies their existence in some way so that they don't feel like a constant failure for simply being the way they are. And in order to have basic well-being, they need an actual, concrete social space where they can be and where they can labor, where they can participate in exercises, where they can participate in practices which are suited to that. And places where they can be taken care of and take care of others. And, you know, in today's society, it's tricky to find that. There are no secular monasteries. And then there's always the, the tricky issue of, you know, trying to bid about an alternative that isn't a cult, right? And then we can go into this another time, right? But basically, if the more sensitive among us had this sort of support, you know, the knock-on effects would be, I think, very good for for everyone, right? Um, for everyone. So that's the second point, right? That this quote by uh, Dorotheus of Gaza serves as a nice introduction, a nice articulation of a different path of life, of the spiritual path. And it demonstrates that it's basically an inversion of the typical way of looking at things, of outcome-orientated, results-orientated, external outcomes, right? Of caring about what happens in physical reality, right? Rather than focusing on what happens in your consciousness, essentially. So in this other way of looking at it, it doesn't matter if you get there, it doesn't matter how long it takes, it doesn't matter what it looks like at the end. What matters is your mental state. And that's a pretty good, if not definition, then I think it's a pretty neat way to get the gist, to communicate a little bit of the, the essence of it. All right, that's it. <laughs> the outcome is one eighth of what's important and your mental and emotional state is the other seven eighths. So that was a nice quote from a cool dude, which serves both as a kind of practical, pragmatic tip and a an useful introduction to whatever you want to call it. <laughs> All right, first video, done. Welcome to the channel. Uh, I'm going to be talking about philosophy, spirituality, religion. Tune in next time for more. <laughs>